Hi there. This is the course Economics for the Rest of Us based on my book of the same name. To see more of my writings, click on the link below. Of course, I would like to welcome you to the course. But first, let's determine that it is really for you. Are you an employer who makes a lot more money than the workers in your firm and you believe that what you pay your workers is what they deserve? This course is not for you. It is not for you because we will learn how wages are determined. Are you a rich person who owns a 40,000 square feet apartment in a crowded city or a private beach on the shoreline and you believe that you deserve both because you bought them in a free market system and we all know that free markets are efficient? This course is not for you. It is not for you because we will learn what economic efficiency is. Or are you a CEO with a huge paycheck that you call compensation and you travel in a corporate jet and you believe that the pay is what you deserve and the jet is a business necessity? This course is not for you either because we will learn how corporations are governed. Have I lost you yet? No, welcome to the course. Let's start the course with a discussion of what is economic efficiency. The need for a definition of economic efficiency came with democracy. Under monarchs, the question of what policies the government should adopt was of no interest to workers. Their opinion simply did not matter. And as for government employees, the question was not complicated for them either. Adopt policies that make the monarch rich and powerful. Or just ask him. Louis XIV, King of France, said, L'état c'est moi. The state is me. And it was. Louis believed that fighting wars would demonstrate his power. Or perhaps he simply liked the sight of them. It did not matter why. Under his rule, his subject fought one war after the next. But in a democracy, the government is of the people and the, by the people. What policy should the democratic government adopt? Policies that serve the people seems like the obvious answer. The answer is not good, however, because some of the people are rich and some of the people are poor, and it is impossible to serve both at the same time. Let's take education as an example. Who in the world is against improving education? But improving education would cost money, so the rich invented the slogan. You can't throw money at education. Throwing money at education is a proven failure, FreedomWorks declares. FreedomWorks is an organization that exists to advocate what it claims is a principle. And that principle is that the government, no matter how small, should be smaller, and taxes, no matter how low, should be lower. You want a better steak, a better car, or a better health insurance? You will have to pay more. But if you want better education for your kids, money has nothing to do with it. It has been proven, FreedomWorks assures us. And the Tea Party has been convinced. Let's take a moment to appreciate this page. While everybody claims to be for better education, education funding has been slashed. Let's see what happened when school budgets were cut. First to be affected was the food that workers' children eat at school. You would be shocked if you knew what food your kid is eating at school, the New York Post tells us. According to the Post, it started in 1981 when the Reagan administration slashed school lunch funding by one and a half billion dollars. This dramatically altered the menu. Districts typically now have just one dollar per child per meal to spend on food costs while tasty, inexpensive fare, such as pizza and corn dogs, dominate. 
Then we cut physical education programs because they also cost money and therefore they also must be a waste. Despite obesity concerns, gym classes are being cut, reports the New York Times. Art and music also cost money. So they are cut too, as we can see from these news reports. When it comes to their own children, however, the rich know that education costs money. The spending in New York City public schools is $14,000 per student. But in the private school, Horace Mann, it is $55,000 for every grade from pre-K to 12th. Given the inherent conflict between rich and poor, how should a democratic government decide which policies to adopt then? The first democracy in modern times, only a half democracy really, was brought about by the French Revolution in 1789. It was only half a democracy because women did not get the vote. The painting we see by Delacroix is of Marianne, the symbol of the new France leading the revolution. It is of course ironic that while the symbol of the revolution is a woman, women did not get the right to vote. But it was nevertheless an advance over the American Revolution that came just a short time before it in 1776, because that revolution gave the vote only to property owners. Workers fought and died for it, but this did not gain them citizenship. Once victorious, the new French National Assembly declared the rights of men. And one of these rights was the right to an equitably financed government. A common contribution is essential for the maintenance of the public forces and for the cost of administration, Article 13 declared. This contribution should be equitably distributed among all the citizens in proportion to their means. In plain English, the French Revolution recognized the income tax as a fundamental right, as a right of men. To appreciate how radical this was, consider that the first American Constitution of 1787, which was voted on by property owners only, explicitly forbade the income tax. It only permitted Congress to collect a tax that is the same for all persons regardless of income. It took more than a hundred years to pass a constitutional amendment, the 16th, that gave Americans the right to an income tax. The 16th Amendment was ratified in 1913. But let's return to the French democracy and see how successful it really was. The Constitution of 1793, which was passed by a popular vote, expanded the Declaration of the Rights of Men. Article 21 stated, public relief is a sacred debt. Society owes maintenance to the unfortunate, either procuring work for them or in providing the means of existence for those who are unable to labor. The French were more or less united in their will to get rid of the monarchy, but they were deeply divided along economic positions. This was not a secret, and the Lacroix had to depict it in his painting. The fighter on Marianne's left, our right, is a worker, and on her right, a businessman, perhaps an owner of a manufacturing shop or a banker, and behind him, a student who wishes one day to become a businessman himself. Businessmen did not want the government to implement the Constitution of 1793, even though it was extremely popular, and the government therefore didn't. This infuriated workers who demanded that the government step down. They formed a party, they called it the Conspiracy of Equals, and declared, Long enough, and for too long, Less than a million individuals have disposed of that which belongs to 20 million of their like, their equals. Let it at last end, 
this great scandal that our descendants will never believe existed, disappear at last revolting distinctions between rich and poor. Of course, the inequality of 1796 pales in comparison to the inequality of today. The manifesto complains that in 1796, 50% of French wealth went to the top 5%. Today, 50% of the world's wealth goes to the top 1% of the world population. But the government did not change its ways, nor did it resign. Instead, the conspiracy of equals was declared a terrorist group, and its leaders, most famous among them François-Noël Babeuf, were all guillotined. In England at the time lived the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. He himself lived under a monarchy, but he thought that the question of who should the government of the people serve and how was worthwhile. He has been much admired for his writings and his body is on display at University College of London. In 2018, he traveled to the Metropolitan Museum in New York City and I got to see it. It was thrilling. Anyway, here is how he analyzed it. Bentham believed that the job of the government of the people is to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Of course, this is just a belief. It cannot be otherwise because the question of what should be the purpose of government is necessarily subjective. What we see on the screen is the pie of happiness. According to Bentham, a government is efficient when it implements policies that make the pie bigger. But how can the government do that? Later philosophers hesitated to use the word happiness when it comes to a government objective. They started using the word utility instead. We will use this word as well. Here is how Bentham analyzed the problem. Bentham explained that everybody derives utility from money. The more money you have, the greater is your utility. This is the utility of a person when she is poor, and this is the utility of the same person when she is rich. Bentham assumed that all people have the same or very similar utility functions, and that the only difference between rich and poor is in the amount of money they have. A person benefits from more money whether she is rich or she is poor, but not in the same way. Suppose a person gets an extra dollar when she is poor. Her utility increases by delta u. This increase is called the marginal utility of money. While a rich person also benefits from an extra dollar, the marginal utility is smaller. In plain English, an extra dollar would help the poor more than it would help the rich. The poor need it more. Therefore, if the government has an extra dollar to give, it should give it to the poor and not to the rich, because this will increase utility by more. This will get more bang for the buck. But of course, the government does not have a buck to give unless it takes. When the government takes one dollar away from the rich, the rich loses the marginal utility of that dollar. And when it passes it to the poor, the poor gains the marginal utility of that same dollar. Therefore, the sum of utilities, or the greatest happiness in Bentham's language, is achieved when the government redistributes money from the rich to the poor. This brings us to the definition of a utilitarian efficient policy. Definition Utilitarian efficient policy. A policy is utilitarian efficient if it increases the sum of utilities in society. It should be noted that in most cases when the government redistributes income, it does not redistribute money. 
There are, of course, welfare programs, but those are minuscule. The government redistributes income when it provides services. Take, for example, roads. Everybody gets to use the roads regardless of their income, but money for the roads comes from taxes, and for the same road, the rich therefore pay more. The same goes for public transportation. In New York City, workers pay $2.75 per subway ride, a fare that many cannot afford. Yet only 38% of the MTA budget comes from fares. It should be noted that the rich pay more even if the tax rate is not progressive. If everybody pays the same tax rate, say 20%, the rich still pay more. In this way, most workers, because the wages are too low, are beneficiaries of redistribution. Here is some food for thought. What additional services should the government provide? What services should the government not provide? We will pursue these questions in future lectures.